Hi, and welcome to Mother's Quest, a podcast for moms like me ready to live our own truly epic life. I'm Julie Neal, a life and leadership coach, community builder, writer, and mom to two high energy boys who challenge me to grow into my best mom! self. Mom! <laughs> I'll be right there. Where was I? Hello, and welcome to the special finale interview of season five of the Mother's Quest podcast. Each season, I invite one person from my inner circle to interview for the finale. And this time, I knew exactly who I wanted to be in conversation with, a mentor and coach who has had a tremendous impact on the person and parent I am today, Leslie Medine. I'm releasing this episode on December 21st, 2020, on the winter solstice in the darkest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere in honor of a great coach Leslie and I had in common, Ed Conboy, who passed away in March of this year. In perfect synchronicity, before I recorded the interview with Leslie, I found an email from Ed written at the solstice 15 years ago that reminded me that the light we so often seek, especially in our darkest days, resides within ourselves. It's fitting because one of Ed's greatest gifts was to create space, get curious, and ask a powerful, illuminating question that would help me, Leslie, and so many others find our own answers within. Leslie and I met and worked alongside one another for a decade at a youth organization she founded in Alameda, California called Alternatives in Action, referred to at the time as the Home Project. It was there that I also came to know and love Ed as he led us through a practice the staff would do weekly on Fridays that we called Reflection. Known locally and nationally as an expert in youth development, leadership, and empowerment, Leslie created The Home Project and countless other organizations from the ground up in her 50 years of work in the world. She ventured into the education field at the age of 16 as a founding member of the first experimental public high school in New York State. Since 1975, Leslie founded eight schools in the San Francisco Bay Area, serving infants through high school students within both the private and public sectors, in addition to a teacher's college. In February of 2019, she retired as executive director of On The Move, an organization focused on the next generation of emerging leaders throughout California, culminating that chapter of her career through writing and performing an incredibly powerful one-woman show for her community called To Be Continued. I hadn't spoken much to Leslie since seeing both Leslie and Ed at Leslie's show. When I received an email just as we were preparing to shelter in place last March, informing me that Ed had suffered a massive stroke and was in a coma. A week later, he passed away. But the group of us who had come together via Zoom in honor of Ed in the midst of the pandemic began to meet virtually the first Sunday of each month, continuing to share stories about Ed and his impact and keeping his legacy alive through our reflective practice. We have been meeting ever since. One of those in our group is Dr. Amanda Kruger-Hill, a youth alum of the Home Project and now the executive director of the Cowan Institute and a professor at Tulane University, who brings us this episode's dedication. Hello, my name is Amanda Kruger-Hill, and I am honored to dedicate this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast to Leslie Medine. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this, Julie. I've loved being back in community together with both of you over these past nine months through our virtual reflection circle. Leslie came into my life 24 years ago when I was 15 and I joined the Home Project as a founding member and my life has never been the same since. This morning I walked in Audubon Park and listened to this interview, heard stories, some of which I was part of and such powerful messages, many of which are deeply part of who I am and what I believe in. In this episode, Leslie shared that she sees children and youth as younger equals. When I was in Leslie's presence as a sophomore in high school, I felt this so profoundly. Leslie asked us what we thought, how we felt, what we envisioned, and really listened to us. She showed us that what we believed mattered. She let us know that we were lovable and capable. She created opportunities for us to have seats at tables where young people were usually not present. We spoke with the superintendent, Dennis Chaconis, 
our mayor, we spoke at school board meetings. I was in the boardroom with Leslie, Casey, and others presenting about the iceberg, with which Leslie shares in this interview. If we had a vision or an idea that we believed in, Leslie helped us figure out how to make it real. We took crazy ideas from chart paper at the Boys and Girls Club and brought them to life. For example, we raised money for and then built the largest outdoor skate park in Northern California at the time still stands today. A child development center, home sweet home, and a high school base, of which I ultimately became principal. Leslie, you have impacted me in many profound ways over these past 24 years. But the way you showed up and demonstrated your belief in me as a younger equal is something that is now a fundamental part of who I am and how I have aimed to show up with the hundreds of young people I have taught, worked with, loved, mentored, and learned from over these years, and how I show up with my two children, Benjamin and Lewis. Leslie, I love and appreciate you so much. Thank you. And to everyone listening, I hope you get a lot out of this episode and so much value. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing so beautifully the impact that Leslie has had in your life and for framing the themes of the conversation to come. As Leslie and I discuss, to do great work in the world, you must be known and know others. I'm so grateful to know you, Amanda, to know Leslie and the principles, practices, and stories that she weaves together in this episode, and to know Ed, who continues to light the way for us and remind us how to strive for greatness. A final note about this episode. You'll notice it's longer than my usual ones, and I also hope you'll find tremendous value in listening. I decided there was no part I wanted to cut, and also that I wanted to give you the opportunity to listen to it in its entirety, rather than releasing in two parts. So if you have more time, find a cozy spot and a cup of tea and settle in. Or if you're more limited, Listen for some while and then press pause and come back again when you're ready. Make sure not to listen with your little ones present as there is some colorful language. Seize the time and space for yourself and let the light in on this dark night. I'm Julie Neal and this is Mother's Quest. Leslie, I'm excited to officially welcome you to the Mother's Quest podcast. This is my finale interview for the season. Each year, invite one person who is in my inner circle who has absolutely shaped who I am to be in conversation with. And this year, it was so clear to me that I wanted that person to be you. I want to start with us setting intentions for this conversation, for how we want to show up or what we hope to bring forward. And I'll start, and then I'd love to hear what's present for you. So there were two things that I was thinking about this morning as I was getting ready for this conversation. One, I was looking through some old emails, and I saw an email from you from several years ago before a meeting where you were gathering some of the people in your inner circle to guide you. And you were on the threshold of a new chapter and thinking about as you were closing your role and your work on the move, how you wanted to document the things that you had learned in your life and in your work. And I know that you have found some answers to that. I was at a play that you put together in February of 2019. That was one of the most remarkable things I've ever experienced. And I know that there are still other ways that we want to capture what you know. And I'm hoping that this podcast could be one thing to contribute to your body of work that people can access and be able to learn from you, from all of the amazing gifts and things that you have, your practices and your stories. So I'm holding an intention to create space for you to share some of those things. And then the other thing is that we lost one of our amazing mentors and coaches and friends, Ed Conboy. Ironically, at the start of the pandemic, although it was not due to COVID, he had a stroke and 
died within a week or so of that stroke. And I really wanted to create some space for us also to honor him because I know so much of who he is lives in your stories and your practices and in my own. So this is both a chance to document your life and work, but also to honor Ed. Those are the intentions that I'm bringing today. What about you? My intentions would be a couple of things. One is to behave and do what you asked me to do. (laughs) (laughs) And the other, and not to go, you know, doing something completely different. And I know that much of your audience are mothers and setting aside 45 minutes to listen is a lot of time for any mother. And so I hope that what I have to share is compelling enough to keep mothers engaged so that maybe there's some gift for mothers today. Mm, Thank you. And I also want to say you're the first person I've interviewed on the podcast who is not a mother. And as I was thinking about having you on, you have become a mother and a coach and a mentor and a nurturer and a creator for so many people in so many ways. And so I think I'm also wanting to bring in the awareness that one does not have to be a mother in this world to dramatically shape the lives of young people. What comes up for you when you hear that? I was thinking about a conversation I had a couple of days ago with a group of young people I've been working with, a group of 11th grade Latinas. And I've been working with them for several months. And I don't remember how it came up, but one kid said the other day, well, you know, we were talking about you and how intimidated we are by you. She said to me, and I was like, what? What do you mean? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're intimidating or something like that. And I kind of looked at her and I was, you know, I said to her, what do you think is intimidating? And she said, well, you know, we're in a room with you, like, like we really have got to pay attention. And I said, well, do you mean that you're aware of how tough I am, you know, as a coach? And she said, yeah, you know, you're really, really tough. And I said, well, you know, I'm here to help you be who you say you want to be. And this kid said, we know that it's coming from a place of caring. And so when I think about the mother piece, or I don't know if it's mother per se, but it's certainly love, that that's what they were talking about. And I told these kids that about, it's got to be close to 20 years ago, I had 14 kids from the home project sleeping over here at my house. And we had an activity. Yeah, I'd never do that again. But (laughs) we had this activity and the activity that we were going to do that we did do with each person. But the prompt was, because I know you will tell me the truth the question I have about myself is, and then they had to say what it was. But the thing was that when they said something or other, the group who really did know the person, you know, would be like, nah, I don't really think that's your question. You know, and they dug and they dug and they dug until they felt like the question that somebody actually got, the real question that somebody actually was wondering about themselves was there. Anyway, this thing went on for like seven hours. I'm not kidding. And it was ending at two o'clock in the morning. And right when everybody finished going, you know, about their question, because it took a lot of time for each person, because that first question you might think about is never the real deep question, Mm. you know, so they had all finished. And then they said to me, okay, it's your turn. And I was like, no, 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 I wasn't planning on going. (laughs) And these were 15 year old, 15, 16 year olds. And they said, no, 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 you're going to go, you know, it's your turn. I knew what my question was for them. I knew what my question was. And it's a question that I had held in my head for a long time, something I worried about. And so I said to them, okay, you know, my question is, are you afraid of me? And they looked at me like surprised, you know, and they were like, no, no, we're not afraid of you. You know, we know that you care about us and you love us. You know, we know that. On the other hand, we know when to duck, you know, when to stay out of your way, but that has nothing to do with we're afraid of you. Mm -hmm. So that's what just comes into my mind about this thing about love or caring or whatever. And that I think that the reason that anybody, myself in this case, but the reason why anybody can be a tough coach where you're not literally hurting the person is if love is present. So if caring and love is present, then it's possible to be 
very tough, which is what people need if they really want to grow or get to the next level or whatever it might be. I am smiling because I don't know. I'm thinking about the very first time I had a conversation with you. I was seeking at the time a place to make a difference. I had been doing policy work and felt quite removed from the youth development and community building work that I was researching about. And I felt like it was time for me to be on the ground doing the work. And I was led to you at the time. The organization was called The Home Project, which was also not a coincidence because I had been living in the Bay Area, but my family was still in Los Angeles and I still referred to LA as home. So I was also seeking a way to make where I'm living now home. And I don't know, I think within the first few seconds, like you came straight out with like, well, what are you looking for? Or, you know, like straight to a question that like cut through any bullshit and was really about like, let me know you and see you. And I always have felt seen by you, loved by you, and pushed by you. Those are incredible gifts that I think are so important to also try to bring into motherhood. Of course, we want to be loving and nurturing, but there are also times where we need to take a step back and be willing to be a little tough or to push or to ask the difficult questions or to be willing to let our kids fail. And those are things that I have seen you do with young people over now decades. So I know we're going to get more into that. I want to move to the first question. Typically, I ask people to share a little bit about their childhood and the impact that their mother had in shaping who they are. But for this conversation, I wanted to ask you to tell me a little bit about your epic life journey, what you were always on a quest for, and the impact that Ed had in shaping who you are today? Yeah, when I first read the question, I thought, I have not a clue about my quest. I don't know that I think about my life in that way. And then I came back to it later, you know, a couple of days later and said, okay, wait, if I was really going to think about this, you know, what would it be? And I think that my quest from childhood was to transcend my childhood and the difficulties in my family. and. I think the quest was to be emotionally well, you know, to be emotionally healthy, which I wondered if that was going to be possible based on what had gone on in my childhood and also the fact that there was mental illness in my family. And I worried for a long time about whether or not I was going to actually be okay. I think the way I worked through some of that or what I did kind of in reaction to it unconsciously was to make things. So I've always made things. I've always created things, projects, programs, initiatives, art, organizations, whatever. And I think that was my sort of my way of getting through all the fear and the worry that I had about whether or not I was going to be okay. So when I stepped into action, I could distract myself from the endless worry about my life. People think about me as a leader. Of course, I have been a leader in organizations. But honestly, I had no interest whatsoever in being a leader or being in the public eye. I think I became a leader accidentally because of my creative endeavors. So there were things I wanted to make, literally, or do or create, and I knew I couldn't do them alone. So I ended up pulling people around me, you know, and building teams of people so that we could make something happen. But it wasn't because I wanted to lead anything at all. In thinking about Ed, in regards to pulling people around me for something or rather, I had met Ed a couple of years before this, which would have been almost 30, well, about, yeah, about 35 years ago. He was a parent in the school I was running. And I did not know him well. And I had a huge challenge in front of me, which was to raise money. I had to raise like $200,000 in three months to make payroll. And I was completely out of my mind. And I didn't know how I was going to make this happen. I had turned over every rock, nothing was working. And I called him, not knowing very much about him, except that I knew he was a coach for Olympic athletes on the mental preparation for, you know, performance. And I called him one Friday night at like 10 o'clock at night. And I said, Hey, I need to raise all this money. I don't know how to do it. Maybe I could learn to run on the track. And the track had become a metaphor 
and then somehow running on the track or, or something, you know, would uncover something that allowed me to raise money. I mean, it was an insanely crazy idea. And of course, I hadn't run or done anything in literally 20 years. He wasn't a track coach. He was the mental preparation guy. He knew an Olympic track coach. He got this guy together. So the guy's name was Tom and myself and Ed. And I was going to learn how to run. And hopefully something was going to happen out of that. And this was the first time I really began to work with Ed. And he was clearly a coach. That was really the first time I was 38. I'm now almost 67. So anyway, long story short, er, so we get up to the track, which was at a college in Oakland, and I show up there and Tom and Ed are standing there. And so Tom says, okay, well, you know, run the lap. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I just thought we were going to kind of talk about running or something. I couldn't possibly run that track. I'll die if I try to run that track. Ed didn't say a word. Tom just looked at me. He didn't say a word. He just said, okay, so start, you know, go. I mean, he just ignored everything I said. And I started to what you could hardly call it running, okay, but I was moving around the track and crying while I was running and saying, I can't do this all the way around crying and saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I came around the first lap and then Tom said, okay, go again. And I'm crying and running and saying, I can't do this. When I came back at the second lap and I hadn't died, Ed said to me, you just keep moving. You just keep moving. It doesn't matter that you are crying while you're doing it. And it doesn't matter that you're saying, I can't do it. But the fact is, you did it. And that kind of thing, I mean, that experience, you know, there are many times when I'm doing something and crying and saying, I can't do it. But I realize, you know, it's okay. You can cry your way through it. You can even say, I can't do this. And as long as you keep moving your feet forward and you're doing it, at some point or other, I came to realize, oh, okay, oh, I am doing it. And I think that that was an incredibly important lesson for me. It was one part of it. During that, we, we called this program, by the way, it was called Catalyst. And the second thing that happened during this time, again, this is about Ed being there. There was a point on the track where I kept seeing a boulder. Well, there was no boulder. There was no boulder there. But every time I come around the second curve, I would slow down because I imagined a boulder in the middle of a track. And one day I said to Ed, hey, you know, we need to figure this out. Like what's going on with this thing, you know, with the boulder, because it's slowing me down. And he said, insight follows action. One day you will go through that curve and you will no longer see the boulder. And then you will know what it means. But you cannot know what it means ahead of time. You cannot figure this out ahead of time. Insight follows action. And of course, one day, you know, I went running and the boulder was gone. And, you know, it was amazing. You know, it was like, oh, okay, now I know something about this. And I couldn't have known before because I liked the idea in the past before I met Ed of like, okay, let me figure it out and then I'll do it. And his thing is, it doesn't work that way. You have to do it and then you'll figure it out. And I think the last thing I'll tell you about this program, because it was the beginning of our relationship. And the beginning of my coaching, of knowing how to coach others, you know, as well. So they had set what I thought was an impossible time for the mile. Okay. I just thought, I don't see how they think I'm going to make this time. And I worked, you know, it was a 12-week program. I ran five days a week. I ran with Tom often. I worked with Ed once a week to try to understand sort of what was going on mentally and emotionally while I was getting ready for this thing. And so the day of the race, Ed had said to me ahead of the race, Ed had said, now listen, the race ends six yards past the finish line. It does not end at the finish line. It's six yards past the finish line. That's when you're done. You know, that's when you're complete. And so, of course, you've heard me say many times, six yards past the finish line. But in any case, I, okay, you know, all right. So I ran, I beat the time that they set. And when I came six yards past the finish line, I was sobbing. Ed was standing there and he said, what are you thinking right in this moment? And I said, you know, my father cut off my legs when he killed himself. And I finally decided to get up and to stand finally after all these years. And it had been 20 years since my father died. And I couldn't have known that. I couldn't have known that that race was about, you know, finding myself in spite of my father's death. 
So that was the beginning of my relationship. Oh, oh my God, I'm, I'm already crying. And so what was the boulder? You know, I can't remember what the boulder was at the moment. And maybe I'm just thinking about it now, but I really can't remember. I'm sure there was an exact something or other. But I think that the boulder was probably that there's always boulders. There's always barriers. There's always obstacles. There's always fear, you know, in anything that matters that you're going to do that matters. You know, you can transcend them. You can run past them. You can literally run through them and overcome them. But it's only by doing it. (laughs) It's not by thinking your way through it. And that had not occurred to me. What an amazing story. I should tell you that we went on then to offer Catalyst to 15 other people, all of whom the people we invited to come in were at some important juncture in their life. For me, it was really coming to understand. I'll say one other thing about this. You'll have to edit some of this, I'm sure. But anyway, the other thing was that right before my actual time trial, or maybe it was just halfway through this 12 weeks, maybe it was like at six weeks, Tom said to me one day, you know, Leslie, something's happening here with your body. You're suddenly standing up. You were kind of stooped over when you started this. And now you're starting to stand up. You know, you're getting stronger through the running, but you're standing up straighter. He said to me, I anticipate you're going to have a major conflict with someone in your life because they will not be able to tolerate your standing up straight. That was the beginning of the end of Beacon. So that was the other piece. I think I must have sensed, wasn't just about raising money, you know, when I was 38, I must have sensed something was coming and I needed the strength to be able to stand up. And Ed was there, you know, through that whole really difficult time in my life. Wow. Oh, I love this story so much. And of course, I've heard the principles and the wisdom from this, but I have not heard where the insight came from this completely. I'm so grateful to hear the whole story. Of course, I have to ask what happened with the 200,000 goal? I raised it. So I'm really curious to know in this moment, how did what you learned on that track and with your first experience with Ed as your coach serve you in the rest of your life? The first time, well, I guess I would basically say that I understood coaching. You know, I understood the need for coaching. I understood what it meant to have a great coach. And I knew not only, not only with Ed, but with other people, I knew, okay, from if I really want to be great at whatever it is I'm trying to do or be, you know, that is never going to happen without a coach on the sidelines. It's just never going to happen. You know, this is what it takes to be great. And I think that this thing about insight follows action trusting that, look, you put one foot in front of the other, you don't have to know. In fact, in most cases, we can't possibly know, or the things we think we know just are blown up in the middle of whatever it is we're actually trying to do. But it's not important to know ahead of time. It's important to move, take action, and then be able to reflect about what was that about? What did I just get? What do I now have that I never would have had before? So the not knowing part was, you know, carried forward forever. And then, you know, Ed just expected, you know, he set a bar, he and Ed, Tom together, set a bar that was just high enough that I couldn't quite touch it in the beginning, but they knew it was possible for me to reach it after a lot of hard work. And so I think I understood that if I was going to help other people be excellent and be effective and be what they say they want to be, that I also had to keep holding the bar just high enough for people to be motivated to try to reach it, but not make it impossible. I knew that from years and years of working with children. I knew that ahead of time, but I don't think I knew it about adults or even teenagers. Mm. I think throughout this conversation, when you say something that sparks a reminder for me about something I've learned from Ed, I'll bring it forward. As you're talking about this and the bar, I'm thinking about one of the first things I ever heard Ed say, which is that you can't hold the bar for yourself. You can't hold the bar and go over it at the same time. Yeah. And that's, you know, one of those places where the sports metaphor is so powerful because of course, if you 
physically imagine someone trying to get over the bar. There's no way that you could hold it for yourself and do that at the same time. The other thing I wanted to say before we move to the epic guideposts, when you said, I don't know if I know the answer to this question about what I've been on a quest for, the answer that came into my mind from knowing you and your work is that I feel like you've also been on a quest for understanding what motivates people to action. Yeah, I remember saying stuff like that Uh, (laughs) in the past. Yeah. And does that no longer feel true? Is that a little bit like that question that you did with the young people when they stayed at your house, where it's like, maybe that was the question that seemed like it was the question then. But when you dig deeper, it was really this question about being emotionally well. No, I think at that time, I think as we, you know, through our lives, the question changes. I think I was interested in that question, what motivates people to action? That's not my question now. I have different questions, but it's not that one. Yeah. What's your question now? My question, I have several of them, but in regards to, because I end up doing a lot of coaching of people who say they want to be leaders. So I think in regards to leadership in particular, I'm interested in working with people who really intend to be great or to aspire to be great. And in my mind, that's not some egotistical thing. That's the person who says, look, I am going to do whatever it takes to be the best I can be of myself in order to lead. And I'm willing to do just about anything to keep learning so that I can get better and better and better. And I don't find very many people. I don't find many people who are really willing to just, you know, pull it out, you know, sort of no matter what, not at the expense of your health or something like that, but just to be like, no, okay, I am going to the ends of the earth to do this, which also takes huge amount of vulnerability to just be like, okay, you know, I'm going to uncover whatever I need to uncover that's in my way. Because oftentimes I think it's about what's in our way in order to be great and why to be great, not just because, oh, aren't I great, but so that I can make the biggest contribution possible to others. So in my mind, I think people get very confused, especially high performers, are often very confused between perfection and excellence. I'm not interested in perfection. I don't even know what it means. I'm really interested in excellence. You know, I think people who really care about excellence are the people I really want to work with. And one of the things that Ed, again, back to Ed, you know, well, I'll say this about that. If you want to become excellent in what you do or how you do it or whatever, you're going to fail. I mean, there's not even a question. You're going to fail along the way. You know, that's a given. And one of the things that Ed said to me many years ago, and then he told me a story about it. He said, listen, I don't care if it's a stupendous success or a stupendous failure. They're the same. It really means that you did whatever it took to go for it. And if you fail, it doesn't matter. He told me the story, and I don't remember the woman's name, although we could look it up. You know, there was a woman, it was, oh God, it had to be at least 15 years ago. She was track star. She was in the Olympics. And I believe what happened was she tripped and, you know, hurt herself, you know, and she was, I don't know, she was not very far from the finish line. It could have been, but it could have been as much as a quarter of a mile from the finish line. Maybe it wasn't quite that long. I can look it up. I think her first name was Jean, but anyway, and she crawled across the finish line. She literally crawled. She couldn't walk. She crawled across the finish line. And that Olympic feat has gone down in Olympic history. You know, incredible things. They don't always look pretty. They don't happen the way we think they will. Listening to you, Leslie, I'm curious now if the question that you're bringing to the people that you want to work with who are committing themselves to be great is what is their boulder? What is the thing that is blocking them? I don't think so. I mean, it's there. I mean, obviously you have to uncover stuff. I'm a person who is very in touch with my feelings. I can easily get overwhelmed by my feelings, actually. And, you know, we've come to call it getting into the spin cycle where you're just spinning around, you know, can't get out of the emotional spin. And when I was in that state, often, One of the things that Ed did for me was, you know, I'd be spinning around, I'd be carrying on for, you know, 35 straight minutes on the phone. 
and he'd sort of just list anyone say anything. And then all of a sudden he would say, almost always, he would say exactly the same thing. He would say, do you want to consider a different way to think about it? And every time he did it, I would instantly stop spinning around or crying or doing whatever I was doing. And I was like, oh my God, do you have a different way to think about it? Yeah, I want to think about this. You know, and oftentimes, sometimes he had a way to think about it. But a lot of the times, he would just ask a question and help me figure out that I had a different way to think about it. And so for me, it was about thinking, you know, and it is about thinking. I think that there are two parts. There's always boulders that you ultimately have to uncover, you know, to help people get past whatever it is that's in their way. But I also think that if somebody is not in touch with what it is they must do what they believe. I have to do this. I have to create blah, blah, blah. I have to work with, you know, something or other, you know, if they're not in touch with like, I was born to do this. This is what I'm doing. If they're not in touch with that, then all the rest of it, in my opinion, the rest of it's secondary. If you don't know quite yet, like, it's not just dreaming. You know, this is what like, I have an internal imperative Like, I have to do this. If you don't know what that is, and I think that's a role a coach can play, if you don't know what that is, then, you know, talking about boulders is not that important. I mean, yeah, sometimes the boulder is in the way of knowing, sometimes, but sometimes it is, you know? But I think in my mind, it's the other way around. It's first you figure out, like, what must you do? Yeah, that's the question. So for me, I mean, just to know, like, Betsy, you may have heard me say this before, but a couple of years ago, I was in this conversation with Betsy about God. You know, I was like, I don't know about this God thing. I still don't know about this God thing. And by the way, I still don't know about this God thing. But she said she was, and she wasn't trying to get me to say I believe in God. But she said, well, let me tell you something, a different way to think about this. Oh, my God. Okay. You know, there it is again. Oh, my God, a different way to think of it, you know. And she said, you know. We Jews believe that God did not make us, but God spoke us into the world. And God has a word for each of us that is the essence of what we're doing here, you know, as a person. So she said to me, do you think you know the word, your word? Could you imagine that you would know your word? I knew it instantly. And I said, manifest, which meant for me, bringing something from nothing, bringing things forward, whether it was an idea or it was a piece of artwork or it was organization or it was helping someone find their way. It was about making something from nothing. And, you know, and so I think that that might be a way to help people figure out that this thing I'm talking about, what must I do? Mm. Okay, now, of course, I'm thinking about what is my word? The only word that immediately came to mind, which is definitely connected to Ed, is reflection. But I don't know if that's it. But I'm going to think about it. Wow, this is so powerful. Okay, so we're going to move into exploring what I call the epic guideposts. And this is where I definitely need you to continue to do the great job you're doing listening to me and following my lead (laughs) because I have learned. So Epic, as you've heard me say, has come to mean for me and for others in the Mother's Quest community, this idea of saying yes to living the fullest expression of ourselves, living the life that is filled with the things that matter most to us is a lot of the things that you've just been talking about, about stepping into our own greatness and our own purpose, and being willing to expand even when we don't know what the path ahead looks like. And then also, EPIC is this acronym mnemonic for the guideposts that I think help us live this life of meaning, especially in the years where we're raising our children. And what I've found now over the last four years, doing these interviews and asking different amazing mothers about how these guideposts show up in their life, that the guideposts themselves illuminate so much. So I know you were a little bit like, I don't know about this interview guide, but I'm appreciating that you're trusting the process. 
So the first guidepost E stands for engaged mindfully with our children. And I'd love to hear the biggest insights you've learned about how to do that. You haven't been a mother, but you've been a coach and an educator and a nurturer, young people for, oh my God, how many years has it been, Leslie? Well, since I was 14, professionally since I was 20, for almost 47. How I see children, you know, is as younger equals. I don't see them as like, oh, they're somehow they're children like less than or something. They're just younger equals. And I am always interested in understanding like how they tick. You know, we could be talking about a seven-year-old. We could talk about a 16-year-old. You know, it's all the same to me. You know, the seven-year-old is as interesting to me as the 16-year-old. And I'm wanting to know, like, what do they want or what are their natural gifts? What might be in their way of becoming who they truly are? Because as children, they're easily shaped. And on the other hand, they come to us as whole people from the very beginning. And I think, you know, what I want for them is to experience, even at seven, you know what I mean, is to experience their greatness. And, you know, I've always said, ever since I ran a school, you know, when I was 28, I've always said this in my mind, there's only two things that children actually really need. That is that they are lovable and capable. That's basically it. This is not very comp. Oh, somebody has to feed them, you know, but basically they need to know they are lovable and capable. But this is not a, like people just talking at children, you know, saying it, they really need to have the experience, especially on the capable side, they really need to have this experience of personal efficacy. They need to have an experience of feeling the power of making things or making change or having influence or whatever. But they also need to know that they can't do it alone, that they need to practice asking for help and somehow knowing, and I think this is hard for a lot of people and even children, certainly adolescents, to know that they really deserve the help. In order to ask for help, you have to believe somewhere in you that you deserve to ask for help, that somebody is going to want to help you. You know, for me, for a lot of different reasons in how I grew up and in my life, I never hesitated to ask for help from many, many other people. I never, ever hesitated. You know, I was in touch with feeling desperate. (laughs) I didn't want to feel desperate. And out of my, you know, desperation, I reached out and asked for help. And the other thing that I see, in, especially in teenagers, lots of different kinds of teenagers, not just kids who are disempowered because of their people of color or their low income or whatever, but it seems to me that, and I didn't have this in my life, I'm not quite sure why, but it seems to me that young people, maybe even adolescents more than children, that young people, they don't seem to be able to stand in their personal power in the face of authority. Sometimes it's in the face of their parents, in teachers, you know, and other people sort of in authority. And for whatever reason, I never quite saw that. Like, I would respect the fact, like, I can remember being like 28 and I met Dennis, you know, he was a superintendent, you know, and I was like, okay, he's a superintendent and I respect that role. You know, I have a lot of respect for that role, but he's just a guy. And I need his help. And so I would just like march into his office without a meeting. I'd just show up and say like, hey, I need your help. And, you know, when I was starting a school, there was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful guy who was running a private high school in Oakland called College Prep. You know, I never had an appointment. I would just show up on campus and say, hey, Bob, I need your help. I don't know how to think about this. And that, I think, I have not figured out how to help children and youth, and even adults for that matter, to respect authority, but to understand there's positional authority and personal authority, positional power, personal power. You know, every human being has personal, quote, power. And how do you get yourself in a place of understanding, like from human being to human being, we are equal. So I think that's for me in thinking about children and not just children, but thinking about children You know, I think that, and I'll give a quick story, which I'm sure you're going to have to edit out of this, but just because of time. But, you know, one of the ways I learned this, you know, in particular with children was that when I was running Beacon, 
we had a garden and we came back from Christmas break. Somebody had planted a little tiny evergreen tree in the garden. And these eight-year-old girls, third graders, three third grade girls were extremely upset about the fact that someone had come into our garden without permission and had planted this tree in their garden. And so we said, well, what do you want to do about this? You know? And they, they decided they were going to go on a mission to investigate who had had the nerve to plant without permission. And they spent three days, you know, never mind math and reading, whatever. They spent three days. They had clipboards. They, they went around and interrogated every single adult in the building. Like, you know, did you do it? Did you do it? You know, whatever. they did all this investigation. They couldn't figure it out. And so I had a hunch that it might have been our landlord whose office was down the block. And so I said, well, girls, you've done everything you can here inside. Maybe we need to go outside of the school and, you know, figure this out. Maybe we need to go down and ask Joe, who was our landlord. And they were like, okay, that's right. Made an appointment and we went down and we, they got into his office and they said, okay, somebody has planted a tree. We don't know who it is. We're trying to investigate. And he says, well, I have to admit it was me. It was me. I did it. And they said, oh, okay, well, you're going to have to come and explain this to the class, to our class. You're going to have an appointment and come and explain to the class and, you know, and take responsibility. This is what they said to this guy. Okay. And so here, you know, a couple of days later, you know, Joe comes to their third grade classroom. He says, I'm very sorry. I really should have asked permission. I see that I made a mistake. I really should have asked permission. And I hope you can accept my apology. You know, these eight year olds, the whole class, you know, and they said, well, we do accept your apology. And I don't think you knew, but there was a reward for the person who led us to the information, which is you, they said to him. And so the reward was that he would get the first basket of vegetables that grew in the garden. And a couple months later, they heard the vegetables and then they go over and they present his award to him. And I will never forget the whole experience, you know, and I thought, you know what, I hope that those girls are now in their 40s, okay? And I hope that those girls remember the experience of what it was like, you know, to take action, to be taken seriously, like what in them, it was in them, but we also provided the opportunity for them to have the experience. Mm, I love that story. I want to move to the next guidepost P, which is about pursuing our passionate and purposeful impact in the world. And for mothers, this is often I talk about it, about our impact beyond our family. What are the biggest lessons you've learned about pursuing impact? And then I also am interested in knowing what is the impact that you want to make now? I think that I want to do whatever it takes for people to be seen or to feel seen and heard and to know that they matter. Pretty straightforward. In terms of leadership, we talked about this earlier. I specifically want to work with people who aspire to be great. People who say like, no matter what, I want to keep learning and I'm going to keep striving for excellence and to continue looking at myself and continue to uncover assumptions I may have about myself and others in the world. At this point, that's about it. I'm not in a place of, even though I keep working on various projects and things I care about, specifically, none of that really matters. Actually creating the projects anymore. Yeah. That's not what I matters do it. to you. Yeah, I do it. Do it because there's somebody has an interest in something or other. But my interest in the difference I want to make with other people is what I said earlier. Yeah. And in terms of the things that you learned from Ed that have shaped how you make a difference or how you help others who are striving to excellence and want to make a difference, the, I'm already hearing that one of the biggest lessons is literally just to move also to be open to thinking about things differently, to have another perspective. I'm wondering what else maybe you learned from your journey and your time with Ed related to this. I would say two things. Ed talked about that the most important thing, no matter what we were doing, no matter what I was doing, no matter what we were doing, you know, he helped with many different people who I work closely with, was about commitment. His thing was, you know, if commitment is there, everything's possible. 
that's it. You know, that was his word. It was all about commitment. That's what I think about in relation to that. One of the things that I learned from you and from Ed and my time with Home Project and Alternatives in Action was the power of choosing in. Can you share a little bit more about that, that whole concept and how that came to be the language that we would use around commitment? Well, choosing in and choosing out, it actually started with choosing out as opposed to choosing in. I don't remember exactly what was happening, but there was a point at which it became very clear. I was working with young people, youth, teenagers, and it became clear that in the organization home, you know, there were kids who just needed to be, they were done. They needed to leave. They just needed to leave. They weren't interested any longer in being committed to whatever it was we were actually doing. And therefore, they were pulling teams down. And everybody knew, and they knew that they wanted to get out. We realized we had no way for people to get out in an honorable way. And so the kids, the two boys, it was Casey and Justin, I think, Casey and somebody, were talking with Steve about it. You know, like, well, how do we do this? And Steve talked about the bell that is the present, like with Navy SEALs. And there's this bell where Navy SEALs are getting ready for being Navy SEALs. There's a bell that's in the courtyard. It's always there. And when a Navy SEAL decides that they just can't, they're going to literally choose out. They stand by the bell and I think they leave their boots at the bell, their military boots, and they ring out. And it's very difficult. A member of a SEAL team rings out, but it's done with tremendous honor. And so, of course, you know, kids being kids, they were like, okay, we have to find a bell. You know, we got to go find a bell. And so, anyway, I don't remember how I got to this, but there was a fire station in Berkeley, engine number six. The kids went to Army Navy stores all over the place in the East Bay looking for a bell. And somebody said, hey, there is a bell that is in engine six or in fire station six in Berkeley. And maybe you could show up at the chief's, you know, go still talk to the fire chief. Maybe he'd give it to you. I don't know. Well, these kids went over there. Okay. And they tell their whole story about the bell and ringing out and da, 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 da. And this fire chief says, you know what? We do have a bell from 1895. It's in the basement. And based on your story, okay, I'm going to donate it to you. This guy comes over with this huge bell, comes to the organization, comes to where the kids are, where we all are. And he comes in full gear. He's dressed like, you know, in like full uniform gear with the medals and the whole thing, right? And he brings the bell and he says, you know, this is an honor for me to give it to you. And I'm going to tell you why. And he says that, I think it was his son or daughter who was a drug addict and hadn't chosen to, maybe it was a daughter, into her life. And so he was sort of saying, I understand this. I understand this thing about choosing in or choosing out. And that they're the same, you know, that you're choosing. And then we hung the bell, you know, in the building, as you know. And that was the story. So it began with, if there's no way to choose out, you're never really choosing in. And that's how we began with the choosing and choosing out. That has continued to be such a powerful metaphor in the organization, a ritual that stayed you know, with us, I imagine still to this day at the high school. And when I left Alternatives Action, I rang the bell. Yeah, just, it's so powerful. And we forget, we feel like we are just stuck in whatever pattern we're in and whatever job we're in, whatever commitments we've made, and we forget that we do have agency. Okay, so the next guidepost, I invested in yourself. What are the ways that you have done that and continue to do that? What are the rituals and practices and things that have most supported your own growth and your own well-being? So for me, what's been important forever is knowing what I need, which I normally knew. I didn't always know exactly what it was, but I knew I had a need. And if I couldn't figure out what exactly the need was, I went to people to help me figure out the need and then to go after whatever it was I needed to find people who were going to help me and to find people who, when necessary, would walk side by side with me, you know, if that's what I needed. I knew I needed to find people who were going to question my assumptions and push my thinking and continue to hold high expectations. 
two things come to mind about Ed in regards to this. So in the first couple of years of the home project, when we really seriously did not know what we were doing every single day, I would call Ed every single night, better part of two years, and I would be either crying or carrying on about, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know, you know, and he would listen and I would carry on. And at the end of every single conversation, he would say to me, are the kids coming? And I'd be like, I'd be really annoyed every night. And I'd be like, yes, Ed, why are you asking me that dumbass question? Yes, they're coming. And then he'd say, are they coming on time? And I'd be like, yes, what's the difference? Yes, they're coming on time, you know? And then he would say, just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, I thought, okay, that's a dumb suggestion. I don't know. That's not helpful. But then I thought, okay, well, that's all he's got tonight and every night. And so I thought, okay, you know, and so that's what I did because I did trust him, you know, and I did trust that he knew me and he knew what he was looking at and he was listening that, you know, if that's what he has to offer, okay, I just guess tomorrow I'll just keep doing what we're doing and hope that something is going to come from this, you know. And I think that the other thing is that Ed was always really annoyed with people because people would say to me, they would say a couple of things. One of the things people would say about me or to me or whatever is like everything I touch, they would say to me or to say to somebody else about me, oh, everything Leslie does, everything Leslie touches turns to gold. They would say that or they would say, oh, it's just magical. It's just magical what they're doing over there. And Ed would, Ed would say, fuck magic. There's nothing fucking magical about this. You know, it's really, really hard work. It's always six yards past the finish line. It's when you can get through the third lap, because the third lap of a mile is the lap in which you want to give up. It's so hard. Fourth lap is strict adrenaline. But the third lap is just, you know, keeping on. You're going to keep on no matter what, even though it seems impossible. And so for me, how did I invest in myself? You know, I had people around me. I knew that I was a very high maintenance person and that there was no way I was going to do this by myself. It was impossible. I wasn't even going to try. So I think those were the things that kept me going, that there were people who somehow believed in me. And I had a trust that if they believed in me until I could believe in myself, that, okay, you know, if they said this was going to be okay, I was somehow going to just keep going. It is really interesting because what I'm hearing you talk about is both the commitment over time, continuing to show up for yourself and for what matters to you again and again, and even when you don't know what the path forward is, but then also always there is the possibility of choosing out. It's both together. Choosing out, yes. The other possibility that was always there was that failure. It was never not in the shadows, at the, or sometimes it was not in the shadows. It was in the bright light. It was in the bright light. I think that the other thing was what I learned and what it also forced me and others I was working with to do was when things were going south, rather than just keep like staying in the rat wheel, because, you know, sometimes things are failing and you're like, okay, we do this. Okay, we do this. Okay, we're running around. Okay, let's try this. Let's and he would just say, can you just stop? Can you all figure out to be together for a day and let yourselves be in this place of absolutely not knowing? Just, okay, you don't know what to do. Okay, you don't know if this whole thing is going to hell in a handbasket. Instead of just spinning around, can we just stop? Because somehow, if you can stop and sit in a circle together, like for a whole day, something is going to emerge. Something. We don't know what it is. It's not going to stay the same. Something is going to emerge. But if you keep spinning, you can't know. And the thing about stopping was then we had to deal with, you know, you had to be willing. And I think he provided some support for us and for myself. You had to be willing to face fear, disappointment, anger, sadness, confusion. You know, you had to deal with your feelings about what was going on. And that was necessary so that we could think better. I mean, that was the idea. You know, this thing about reflection, the reflective practice we did was, it was emotional clarity plus critical thinking 
leads to more effective action. So that was what he was able to help us, you know, help, help us do. And so that's what I was, in terms of investing in myself and everybody around me who we, I was working with, those were some of the things that I was like, okay, I don't really want to go there either. You know, I don't really want to stop and be like, oh shit, you know, this isn't working, but it was essential. Before we started uh, officially recording, you and I were checking in and I said that I drew a tarot card this morning for some guidance and the card is from my friend, Lindsay Para and Sarah Love's Mystics Oracle deck. And I'll link to this in the show notes. But the card I picked was basically this completely black card. There's like nothing on, there's no picture. Their whole deck is like these beautiful illustrations. But the card I picked this morning was literally a black rectangle. And the card is the unseen card. And the guidance is you are walking into the not knowing. You know, I'm an artist. You know, all of my tendencies are towards art and creativity. And I think that's what, that's who artists are. When you could be staring at a blank canvas, you could be staring at a blank piece of paper in which you're supposed to be writing something. You could be standing on a stage. I believe that creative people we are drawn to them because they started out in a place that they always start in a place of not knowing. They always started. So the thing that makes the thing so, quote, pure is that it came out of struggle to find the way. I talk to organizational leaders who are doing great work, who then some funder says or somebody says, oh, my God, you do such a great thing. You know what? Really? You need to replicate this thing in 50 places, you know? You need to, what is that? What's the other word people use? Uh, replicate or, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, and I say to people, look, the reason why the thing you're doing is so great is because you and whoever you're working with, because you had constructed it. You had to mold it and throw it away and do it again. And that's what makes what you're doing so great. It isn't about, let me give you a webinar or a manual, and now somebody else can go do it. It is because of the struggle of trying to figure it out that makes it such a beautiful, wonderful thing. And that's what people don't always understand. Okay. Before we move off of this guidepost, I am curious about like any like rituals or practices that you have committed to over the years that have supported you in all of this. You know, I think what I've said is practice is going to find others to help me be able to see what I can't possibly see on my own. Mm. Are there some things that you do every day without fail that have just become a part of the way that you live your life? I only have one ritual that is part of every day, and that is that I write every morning for a half hour. I write longhand. I keep the pen moving for a half hour. If I can't think of something to say, then I just keep writing. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to write about but I write every morning. I almost always remember my dreams. So I write, I do it when I wake up and I have my tea and I have my ritual around this and I write every morning, longhand, same pen. Sometimes I write about my dreams and I write about my day the day before and I write about what I'm thinking about. Sometimes I write about absolutely nothing, you know, but that's how I start my day every day. That's the only ritual I have. Was that influenced by the artist's way in the morning pages? Or is this something you just developed on your own? I started doing it when I used the artist way at a time when I was 40 at a time in my life when I just had no idea what in God's name I was going to do next. And it was right after I left the school. And I thought, I have no idea like how to get up in the morning or what to do. And so I don't know how I happened upon it, but I did. I happened upon the artist way. And ever since then, you know, I've been writing every morning for the last almost 27 years. Wow. The last guy post is C. It stands for connected to a strong support network. So we remember that we are not alone on our journey. You've already been talking about how that has been such a foundation in your life, the ability to ask for help, the ability to create something with people. What else feels important to share or name about your insights about building community and connection? You know, the only thing that I, after I read this, you know, when you sent it to me, really the only thing to add is that, you know, the people that I feel most connected to 
are the people that I'm doing hard work with. Those are the people I feel most connected to through whatever the work is. And it really doesn't matter what the work is. It's just that we're in it together. And we're, you know, I think that for me, and I think it's true for the people I work most closely with, and I've worked with many, many people now over some people over 20 years, some people over 30 years that, you know, we've been in it for a long time together, time over time. There were many days over the years, many, many, many days over the years where I'd be like, oh my God, I just don't know how I'm going to do another day of this, or I don't want to do this or whatever it is. And all I had to do was think about the people who I am working with. And I'm like, am I going to let these people down? And I thought, hell no, I'm not going to let them down. And that's what got me to keep going. And I'm guessing that for others who I work very closely with, that they had many mornings also where they're like, oh, hell no. And they thought to themselves, well, I'm not going to let these people down. Yeah. I just think about how much I've learned from you and Ed about the importance of being an authentic relationship with people in your life and really knowing people. I talk about this all the time. I don't know if I'm getting this principle exactly right, but something about great work in the world comes from being known and knowing others. In order to do great work in the world, you must be known and know others. Uh, That's it. Casey Fenton, age 15. Mm. Well, since we're recording this for who knows what else we'll do with this, can you tell me the story? Oh, sure. So we were about 14 months into home you know, came to be called the home project. But anyway, it was really home. And we had been asked by the Levi Strauss Corporation, not the foundation, this was through Jill Janoff, to come and speak to the leadership team or the board, I guess it was the board of Levi Strauss Corporation about home and how it got started since it was a youth-led nonprofit. And people were very interested in, you know, how organizations develop. And they asked us to come and speak. And, you know, there had never been youth in the boardroom of the Levi Strauss Corporation. And the day before, you know, we had been thinking about what we're going to say. And we were told we only had 10 minutes to give the whole story about how the organization got started, and which seemed impossible. And I was sitting with five young people, five 15-year-olds, one of whom was Casey. I think Amanda was in the room as well. And maybe Justin too. And I said, well, what are we going to say? You know, we have 10 minutes. How the hell are we going to tell this story in 10 minutes? And so the kids said, oh, 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 let's tell the story of the iceberg. The story of the iceberg was from the week before they were screwing around on the computer and they turned an iceberg upside down on the computer. And they brought me the photograph and they said, hey, this represents home. And I said, I don't get it. And they said, well, in the real world, usually you see a little tip above the water and the icebergs underneath it. But in the home, in the home project, it's upside down. You see almost everything, but then there's a little tip under the water, which is kind of private that you never really see. And that's home. They had told me this a week ago. And I said, you got to be kidding me. You think we're going to go into some corporate board meeting and we'll talk about a goddamn iceberg? Are you out of your minds? You know, I was so frustrated with them. And, you know, and I was usually pretty aligned with their, you know, young people often are very divergent thinkers. And I was often aligned. This time I was just completely annoyed. And I thought, I don't know what in God's name you're thinking about. And I said, listen, that is totally wrong. Okay. All you need to do is your team, your group needs to know what the goal is, and then you can accomplish it. Period. You know, and Casey says, Leslie, that's not true. In order to do great work in the world, you must be known and know others. And if you don't, the work will only be mediocre. I was like, oh my God, you know, and I left at the end of the day and I thought, all right, I don't know, we're going to ride in San Francisco and tell this iceberg story. We'll get thrown out of the board meeting. I don't know. Fine. This is what we're going to do. So I went home that night and I thought of something weird, not weird, something that happened earlier in the day. Earlier in the day, that same day, I had been invited by a bunch of teachers at Alameda High to come and help them with something. I did not know these people. They did not know me. I spent about an hour with them. We did whatever the task was. And it absolutely, as I was reflecting about it, it felt meaningless. You know, I didn't really know them. 
I have no idea what they really want. They don't know me from a hole in the wall. And like, what was that about? We went through the task, we did it, but it didn't mean anything. So we went to the board meeting. We get in there. The kids tell the story about the iceberg. People are totally curious about it. And we ended up in that meeting with them for about 45 minutes with the board. And then forevermore carried forward the story. And the thing about it, you know, which I always knew about young people, you know, was that like, how could Casey know that as a 15 year old? You know, he didn't have that experience per se. You know what I mean? It was just a knowing. It was just some knowing. Well, here's something I want to say that I feel like we haven't touched on yet, which is also something that profoundly changed how I think about my work, but also my motherhood, which is this idea that if we want to help young people grow and push themselves and build relationships, and make a difference and make an impact, then the adults that are working with them have to also be willing to do those same things themselves. And that young people learn more from us by what they see us doing and what we're modeling than what we say. And so I'm thinking that the reason why Casey knew that is because that's what you were creating. That's what you were modeling. That's what you were showing in everything that you had built with the home project. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that was the essence of it. I don't know. Maybe. I'll tell you this, you know, from my own experience with my father, as an example, my grandfather either managed or owned, I'm not sure, an apartment building in the Bronx. And when my grandfather died, I was about eight, my father took over the management of that building. And we went every Sunday to the Bronx, to this building, with a lot of, you know, low-income families who lived there. And my father would knock on each person's door. I'd be with him, you know. And I was aware that it was cold in the hallways. I was aware, like, oh, you know, they live differently than me, you know, kind of different. But my father would knock on each door. I was right with him, you know. And he would say, oh, Mrs. Rodriguez, you know, oh, tell me about your sink. And he had this yellow legal pad. He was a lawyer and, you know, housing organizer. But anyway, he had this yellow legal pad, you know, and pencil, and he'd be taking notes. But there was a way that he was with each person. You know, it was just this, like, there was nothing different about them than him. He spoke to each person with respect. It just was the way he was. He didn't see them. I mean, we're different. We were different. We, of course, we were different, but he didn't see them from a humanity standpoint as different. And my father never talked about that. He just was that. And so I think that sometimes, you know, with parents, especially, you know, parents who are reading and thinking and da da da, there's an awful lot of talk, a lot of talk, hyperverbal stuff going on. And, you know, it goes in one ear and out the other because the kids are not having, the, they don't understand it developmentally, they can't. So it's just a lot of wasted words, you know? And every once in a while, I mean, my father never said to us, hey, we're Jews and therefore you will give back because that's what we were put here for. He never said it. He just did it. He didn't have to say it. And I'm not saying that parents shouldn't periodically, every once in a while, give a framework for what the behavior is about or the reason behind the behavior. Yeah, that's important. But it's much more important the being of whatever it is you are. And that's what your children are picking up. You know, that's what is going into their cells, you know, is the experience of what you are being or doing or committed. That's what it is for them. That's what they remember. It's not all the words. Mm -hmm. And there is though a vulnerability about being open to talking about how you're feeling talking about what you're struggling with and what you care about that I always saw happening. I saw you doing that with young people. I saw as a community of adults, us owning that we were also human beings in the circle with our own fears, emotions, and struggles. Not only not feeling like we should hide it, 
but being our authentic selves and being open and honest was part of the work we were there to do. Yeah, I think the distinction is between private and personal. Mm, Yeah, say more about that. So kids didn't really care about us and our private little stories. They really didn't care. You know, they're much more involved, self-involved and, you know, whatever, exactly what they're supposed to be. They don't really care about the individual private stories. It was much more about, again, we're back to how we behaved. Here's an example. Okay. I remember this time. It was so weird. It was first year of home. We were in that horrifying little God, boys and girls club attic. And one day there were kids from the boys and girls. We were on a second floor. So you could look out the window and see the little kids from the boys and girls club playing. And so one of the kids in our group was looking out the window and said something bizarre like, oh, something about Hitler. It was something bizarre regarding the kids and Hitler. I don't know. And I lost it. You know, they were just fooling around about Hitler. And I just, I lost it. You know, I was like, you can think whatever you want to think. I don't want to ever hear you make jokes about Hitler in my presence. Okay, do not do it. So, okay, they got the message, you know. I didn't go into some big story about why and this and that. It was just like, look, this is important to me. There was another time we were on the Alameda High School campus, another example. And we had two African-American kids and they were out at lunch, you know, on campus at lunch. And some kids, some high school kids were throwing garbage at them. And they came back in, into our room, you know, and they were sobbing. And there were other kids in the home project who were witnessing that situation and didn't say anything. And I was livid, you know, and I just was like, you know what? Those perpetrators, those kids out there, I don't want to talk to them. Somebody else can handle that. That's not my business. I want to have you understand that we are not about being silent witnesses. I don't care what the perpetrators are doing. It's about the silent witnesses. Your friends and, you know, your peers in this group were being abused and you stood there silently? Like, I do not tolerate that. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And a lot of it's like, you know, because so again, it's they're getting like what matters. And so I'm not going to go into some personal story about, you know, whatever. I just was like, look, what do you stand for? What do you believe in? What do you care about? And I wasn't afraid to show them when I was angry about something or shocked by something or saddened or disappointed or whatever it was. You know, I mean, they saw all of it. (laughs) There was nothing hidden from the standpoint of, you know, the rainbow of emotions that a human being could experience. We're at the point now where I want to invite you to give me a challenge and anyone listening, a challenge for something that we might commit to doing or ways of being that can help us step into the fullest expansion of who we are meant to be into our greatness, into what I would call living our epic life. When Ed died, as you know, Julie, a number of us, I think it was 15 or something, we on a first call, actually before he died. It was in the week that he was dying. We were on a call together. Everybody was telling stories about Ed. Some of them were funny. Some of them were, you know, serious. And everybody was, you know, sharing a story or stories about Ed. And I was aware and wondering if he knew, if we had ever told him these stories, if we had ever told him his voice in our head that we carried around. And so I think oftentimes we don't necessarily think to tell somebody, you know, the thing that is the difference that made the difference to that person. When I was working on my own monologue, you know, what I was curious about was, is there anything from our relationship together, not just our work together, but our relationship together that you carry around in your head or in your heart that you use or pull out that is a part of your life when you're working or caring about others. That's what I was curious about. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about me. It was about something that happened between us that you carry around. It helps you in your life, whatever it might be, or you share with others and you pass it along to others. If there's a challenge for you, Julie, 
of someone whom it might even be hard to share it with them in writing. It could be in writing. It could be, you know, done verbally. Now, oftentimes, unfortunately, not in person. I think Zoom, I don't know. But is there someone in your life for whom you carry their voice in your head and you haven't ever told them and they're not aware of it? And they might, as is true of me, people tell me many times things I supposedly said that I don't remember saying. But what's important to me is that that thing that I said made a difference for somebody. So I guess the challenge would be, is there someone in your life for whom you haven't told them? If you don't choose to tell them, to think about what might be stopping you. Yes. Okay. So I absolutely say yes to doing this. I feel like it might be more than one person. I'm thinking about also, I mentioned this to you earlier, Genji Heiston, who we both know, who just came out with her first book called Beyond the Hashtag. And I was reading it last night as I was thinking about our interview today. And it is so profound what is in this book. She basically has written love letters to the Black men in her life, including her father, her husband, her children, some of whom are still with her living. Some have passed away, but she's writing to them as if she's speaking it to them now. And it's so profound. And so I was thinking that before I close out the season, I'd like to write a love letter to Ed about the gifts that he's given me that I carry with me and his voice that's in my head. So I know I want to do that. And I also want to sit with who are some of the other people maybe who I have not spoken or shared the impact that they've had on me. Thank you. Let me add one thing again. I was thinking about this yesterday. When I work with young people, youth in particular, many, many young people tell me that they don't think their parents are proud of them or their parents have never expressed that they're proud of them. And they're still trying to prove that they want their parents to be proud. And they're still trying to prove it. I know many adults who would say the same. I was telling the kids yesterday, because I work with, you know, the ones, the current ones I'm working with. And I said to them, I want to tell you a funny little story. And the story is that we did this in base a long time ago. You know, we had a huge parent meeting. I don't know if you were there or not, Julie. We had a huge parent meeting. It was the end of the semester, maybe the end of the first semester of the first year. I think it was first semester of the first year of base. And we had the parents there. We said to the parents, you know, a lot of times kids wonder how you really feel about them. And, you know, as parents, you know, you're busy. You don't really have time, et cetera. So we're going to give you paper. And you're each going to write a letter to your child. And then you're going to put it in an envelope. And the next morning, we're going to hand out these letters to every single child and let them read it. And I remember this, you know, and they did it. The parents did it. Every single parent did it. And we handed those letters out the next morning. And some kids were just sobbing. They didn't realize how their parents felt. So I would say this about mothers, in this case, since we're talking about mothers especially mothers of teenagers, especially mothers of teenagers. If your child has a hard time listening to you about anything, because, you know, as teenagers, your kids think you're stupid, mostly, or, you know, out of touch or whatever they think, this would be maybe another challenge to write a letter to your child about how you really feel about them. Maybe it's not something you give them right now. Maybe it's something you write and you keep it for a time when they're not just teenagers, And they could know how maybe they're 22 when they're 22 and they're more ready to know. Or maybe it's when they're about to go off to college if they are, you know. But maybe it's given at this time and maybe it's just held. So you know how you feel. And when you believe that they're ready or it's a time for them to hear it, you you give it to them. I think that that's sometimes a very difficult thing to do. But I think it makes a gigantic difference in a child's life. I love that. So it's a two-part challenge. They're related. It's to think about people in our life who have shaped who we are and how we think and to write a letter or reach out to them and let them know. But then also our children impact us. And I know my kids have absolutely shaped who I am. And there's so much I see in them that I love and that I value. 
and um, inviting us to write a letter to our children about what we see in them. We're at the end where we would do acknowledgments. But before we do the acknowledgments, I wanted to read something that I found from Ed last night. I just put a search in for emails from Ed, and I don't know why this particular one came to the top, Synchronicity. It was written on December 21st, 15 years ago in 2005. And I wanted to just speak it into this episode and then have that lead us into acknowledgments. So he wrote, dear friends, the year is winding up or down now. I never know which one it is. And I wanted to take a moment to let you know that you are in my thoughts and such as they are in my prayers. As I went through my address book, it was a wonderful task to conjure up an image of each one of you as I added your name to the small group list. These times, dark though they may seem, are the times we have. For the last few months, I've had the great good fortune to be surrounded by some extraordinary young people. Some of them are on this list. Gradually, they are infusing me with hope and even a little faith. Being with them has brought me to realize just how much I am dependent on them to make meaning of my life long after I'm gone. I'm aware more keenly than ever that this moment I call a lifetime is all I have right now. And that awareness is unimaginably liberating, a healing gift that lightens the load when I can stay in that awareness. I hope within this expansive moment, we all have many more little moments to share Moments like glass beads for all of us to string together. So I want to open it up to acknowledgments, Leslie, for you to share anything that you want to name that you're taking from this conversation, from our reflection with Ed, maybe even from this note that I just read, whatever's present for you. Well, Julie, I've lost track of how many years we've worked together. It's a lot of years. Worked together, known each other. and. I acknowledge your pushing past my resistance (laughs) of lots of things. Glad to have done this today. I'm missing it a lot. I have not stopped missing him since March, but especially maybe because of the darker times, you know, the light and all that. I'm really missing him a lot right now. And maybe because also I just finished coaching a, a group of wonderful young women And I'm so in touch with, you know, what it is to be a coach. So I appreciate you. It would have been a different conversation if it was just you and me, but bringing him in to this has been really wonderful. So I really acknowledge all of that. I'm thinking about this time of year, which Ed named in this email is like we're approaching the darkest day of the year. And these last four years in our country have been dark in many ways. And these last months of the pandemic, since we lost Ed, have been challenging. And the way in which like the holiday of Hanukkah and the message that was coming from Ed in the email was about finding light in the darkness. And that the card that I pulled this morning and so many of the stories that you were sharing in this conversation. And so I'm thinking about how much you and all of my experiences working alongside you have been a light in my life and the wisdom from Ed and the times that we sat in circle, how much it illuminated who I am and who I want to be and how so many of these stories and these principles and practices and distinctions and perspectives, personal versus positional power, difference between personal and private, choosing in and choosing out, insight following action, the power of being in community and asking for help and being vulnerable and being known and knowing others. It has all absolutely shaped the person that I am today, the work that I've been able to create and manifest, and really my wishes and goals and my own pursuit for becoming the best person I can be 
and doing great work in the world. I'm so grateful that I found my way to you and that we found each other again, you know, in these last months after Ed has passed away, this ability to be in circle together again every month, just incredibly grateful for your contribution in my life. And I'd say that's my first love letter (laughs) of many more to follow from this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about how to join the Mother's Quest community, visit mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, and help us to spread the word. I want to end with some words to help light the way on your quest. Seize the day. Love your people. Honor your gifts. Until next time.